German 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant believed that any form of sexual pleasure between humans necessarily implies a violation of their humanity. Humanity for Kant is the way that we can look at other people with dignity and see them as an end in themselves. That means that instead of looking at them as something that we could utilize for our own purposes as a means to an end, we should treat them as rational beings with rational goals and orientations. For Kant, this is what distinguishes humans from animals or lifeless objects. According to Kant, sexual love reduces the other person to an object of appetite that is being used solely to fulfill a personal urge. The sexual partner is not treated as an end in itself, but merely as an object for one's pleasure. In Kant's view, the emotional state that humans experience through sexual pleasure is a very powerful emotional sensation that takes control of them and therefore makes them forget the humanity of other people. Accordingly, Kant condemned prostitution for being an institutionalized form of this degrading relationship of objectification, quote, if a person allows himself to be used for profit as an object to satisfy the sexual impulse of another, if he makes himself the object of another's desire, then he is disposing over himself as if over a thing, and thereby makes himself into a thing by which the other person satisfies his appetite. Now since the other's impulse is directed to sex and not humanity, it is obvious that the person is in part surrendering his humanity and is thereby at risk in regards to the ends of morality. Human beings have no right, therefore, to hand themselves over for profit as things for another's use in satisfying the sexual impulse. Kant's solution for the problem of sexual objectification is marriage. Since someone undermines the dignity of their sexual lover by seeing them as an object of their sexual pleasure, the solution for Kant must be the reciprocation of this act by the other partner. In Kant's eyes, there's some sort of compensation for the objectification within the institutionalized form of monogamy that is marriage. If I instrumentalize my partner, but my partner does the same thing to me on a monogamous ground, it brings a morally tolerable equalization of the objectification. Kant writes, quote, if I yield myself completely to another and obtain the person of the other in return, I win myself back. I have given myself up as the property of another, but in turn I take that other as my property and so win myself back again in winning the person whose property I have become. While Kant undoubtedly sharply analyzed the way in which humans can instrumentalize others for their own purposes and with that objectify them, his representation ultimately seems to be a moral depiction of the normative practices within the civil society he was part of that lacks a profound reflection of the patriarchal power relation that were part of it. About 200 years later, feminists Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon draw on the basic idea of objectification that Kant established. Dworkin and McKinnon, however, link the conception to the subject of gender inequality within patriarchy. According to their conception, within the power relation of patriarchy, women are systemically objectified. The authors exemplify this relation through the subject of pornography. Through pornography, men are socialized into learning that women are tools for use for the pleasure of men. That means that within patriarchy, women are instrumentalized as something to be used, being valued solely based on their physical appearance. Using Kant's terminology, McKinnon writes that pornography socializes men into making women a means to the end of male pleasure as opposed to a means in itself. Additionally, Dworkin describes how pornography dehumanizes women by turning them into a commodity that can be bought, sold and used. This depersonalizes women and takes away their individuality. In contrast to Kant, however, McKinnon and Dworkin don't see sexuality per se to be inherently problematic. The way, however, it is constructed within patriarchal socialization is. Whereas Kant saw the objectification to be inherently related to the realm of sexuality, the feminist authors see it as a particular patriarchal appearance of sexuality. It is intrinsically defined by the unequal power relation through which women are objectified. McKinnon writes that all women live in sexual objectification the way fish live in water. Now, a particularly interesting part about the analysis of objectification of Dworkin and McKinnon is how this unequal gender relationship of objectification of women not only socially arranges the way men perceive sexuality, it also arranges the way women internalize sexual desire. 
while men learn to link their sexual desire to a scenario of domination and objectification of women, women accordingly learn to link their own desire to being dominated and objectified. In 1995, American philosopher Martha Nussbaum picked up on the debate with her essay Objectification. In her work, Nussbaum tries to systematically analyze what is actually expressed when talking about objectification. She then identifies seven different ways in which one can talk about objectification. I won't go through them all here, but I provided a link in the description which will give you access to the essay. What is important to note though is that Nussbaum argues that not all of these forms of objectification are inherently problematic. She uses literature examples to compare different forms of objectification with one another. She finds instrumentality where the objectifier treats someone as a tool for his or her purpose to be a particularly problematic type of objectification and identifies it to be the main critical subject of Dworkin and McKinnon. Nussbaum uses the example of a 1995 Playboy magazine in which actress Nicole Sheridan is playing tennis while her skirt is lifted up, being titled with Why We Love Tennis. Nussbaum writes how this turns a person into a depersonalized fungible commodity that exists as a mere tool for male pleasure. So at this point, Nussbaum pretty much agrees with the analysis of Dworkin and McKinnon. She, however, differs about the idea that objectification is intrinsically negative. She says that within the right context, objectification can even be a wonderful part of sexual life. So if the moral evaluation of objectification can differ, and it can be both problematic but also unproblematic, how can we differentiate if we are dealing with good or bad objectification? Now before I will try and answer the question, I want to introduce another concept that is strongly related, which is the Marxist notion of reification. Marxist philosopher Georg Lukács used the term to describe how humans within the economic relations of capitalism are subjected to the logic of commodity exchange it inherently holds. The social relations of reification restrict the human existence to a fragmented, highly mechanized and specialized pattern. German critical theorist Axel Honneth later described reification as a process in which humans withhold recognition towards somebody. This can happen through certain motivations or narratives which can lead to the denial of owing someone to be recognized. An example for this could be a racist ideology in which certain humans are less worthy than others, leading believers to withhold recognition towards people of this group. But any social relation in which certain economic motivations are prioritized could possibly lead humans within that context to disregarding recognition towards people. Now this sounds somewhat similar to Kant's conception of objectification, in which somebody views another person as a means to an end, instead of seeing them as a means in themselves. Moreover, the concept of reification shows how the problem of objectification is not exclusive to the realm of sexual relations. Humans can instrumentalize other humans not only based on their sexual desire, but also for example based on other motivations such as the narrative of utilization within a certain economy. But Nussbaum has pointed out how certain forms of objectification don't necessarily need to be bad or can even be something positive. So how can we now morally distinguish what differentiates problematic forms of objectification from those that aren't? Nussbaum says that it is important to look at the context of a situation. Objectification can be a positive thing within the realm of equality, consent and respect. She writes, chosen resignation of autonomous self-direction or her willed passivity may be compatible with and even a valued part of a relationship in which the woman is treated as an end for her own sake, as a full-fledged human being. Nussbaum here speaks of something that is chosen, therefore we are dealing with willful behavior as opposed to behavior that is forced. This idea shares similarities with the conceptions of positive freedom and autonomy I've talked about in my last video. The central idea within these conceptions is that humans are free or autonomous to the degree that they can coherently integrate different meanings and desires with the absence of inner conflicts and constraints. If certain interactions are defined by their conflictual character that isn't coherent with someone's volitions and desires and therefore doesn't allow someone to identify with it, we could talk about morally problematic objectification. If we relate this to the realm of sexual pleasure, we could say that as long as, for example, being objectified is coherent with our wants and needs and therefore is of a non-conflictual nature, it is unproblematic. If we look at Dworkin's and McKinnon's conception from this perspective, we can see how patriarchal power relations predetermine the ways in which sexual relations are set up. There has never really been a choice. 
thank you very much for watching this video. If you have any questions or anything you want to get off your chest, feel free to leave me a comment down below. If you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate if you could subscribe to my channel if you haven't done that already uh, and leave me a like. And um, until next time, bye bye.